Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Rotary Club of Madison. I'm Charles McClymonds, club president, and it's great to have so many people. It's a lively crowd today, isn't it? Ah, you're all excited that uh, that the weather's warming up and the roads are, are getting better. So um, today's meeting is being sponsored by Laura Gallagher, president and founder of The Creative Company, and Steve Goldberg on behalf of the Red Caboose Child Care Center. Red Caboose is Madison's oldest child care center, serving and educating more than 5,000 and children during its 50-year history. They just moved into their new, yes, thank them. They just moved into their new home on Winnebago Street where they're able to serve three times as many kids as before. There are some, uh, some information on your table. You can look at that. But uh, let's please thank Laura and Steve for sponsoring Red Caboose in today's meeting. Thank you. Please remain standing in today's opening patriotic song. Darren Harris, Joe Lanus, and Robert Reed will lead us in singing This Land is Your Land with Elaine Mishler at the keyboard. And then afterwards, I think you all have a little animal on your table. We're going to be doing Old McDonald's. So uh, respond to the animal on your table. Make the appropriate animal song. <laughs> From the redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. As I was walking that ribbon of highway, I saw above me an endless skyway. I saw below me a golden valley. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land, this land is my land. From California to the New York Island, from the redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. All right, Rotarians, this is a participatory song. We have an amazing speaker today, Ruth Schmidt from WECA, so we're going to get in the youth spirit. <laughs> Good news for all of us, I um, practiced this morning with my one-year-old, so she did not boo me out of the room, so that's good. So here's how it's going to work. We have to honor four animals today. So I have my assistants, Darren and Robert, who's going to help with those animal sounds. And you have on your table a placard of the animal that we are expecting you to emulate. So without further ado, Old MacDonald. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and on that farm he had some cows, E-I-E-I-O, with a moo-moo, moo-moo, moo, moo, moo-moo. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and on that farm he had some Pigs, E-I-E-I-O, with a <laughs> McDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, old McDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and on that farm he had some sheep, E-I-E-I-O, with a ba-ba, ba-ba, ba ba Ba-ba, McDonald. Thank you, Toto. E-I-E-I-O. One more. Old McDonald had a farm. E-I-E-I-O. On that farm, he had some ducks. E-I-E-I-O. Quack, quack. Quack, quack. Quack, quack. Quack, quack. Old McDonald had a farm. E-I-E-I-O. Nice job. 
I think he also had a bunch of turkeys, but I'm not going to I'm not going to say anything else about that. Okay, today's guest will be introduced by Craig Weddle. Is Craig here? Come on up, Craig. As I call your name, uh, please stand up and remain standing until uh, we call the names of all our guests. Uh, Molly Winding Dewey is a guest of Jennifer Winding. Sarah Schilling is a guest of Laura Gallagher. Ben Safarbi is a guest of Laura Gallagher, and it is Ben's birthday today, so wish him a happy birthday. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, John Bonset Veal is a visiting Rotarian from Oregon. Kristen Halverson is a guest of Mark Green. Mary Cole Lobb is a guest of Joey Cardine. Lisa Fiala is a guest of Steve Goldberg and Laura Gallagher. Kathy Markland is a guest of Tanya Letman Shu. Betsy Parker is a guest of Tanya Zastro. Justin Swingen is a guest of Tanya Zastro. Kelly Hook is a guest of the program committee. Dana Schmuck is also a guest of the program committee. Kathy Wiegand is a guest of Tom Pop. Elizabeth Johnson is a guest of Carol Trone. And Tia Sura is a guest of Marcio Sierra. Please welcome our guests. Thank you, Craig, and welcome to all of our guests and our visiting Rotarian, former member of our club and leader of our ethics symposium facilitator. So, John. All right. Um, today's Rotary Moment of Gratitude will be pro provided by Areli Estrada. Um, Areli, come on up here. Uh, Areli is Executive Director of Affordable Dental Care, Dental Care, and she joined our club in 2022. She was also recently elected to our Rotary Board of Electors, and she starts serving her two-year term on July 1st. She will come up and give a moment of Rotary Gratitude. Thank you, President. Uh, buenas tardes. I think that's good afternoon, but I also get confused with buenos dias. I think that's good morning. Um, I am very grateful to be here um, today. So here's a little bit of background about me. I grew up in LA, and I cannot believe I've been in Wisconsin for more than 18 years now. I moved to Manitowoc, um, so I've experienced a culture shock. Yes. Um, so, but I guess my I need to focus on um, three things um, as I speak. So it's serve, connect, and grow, and I think that's what Rotary has really done for me. So. Growing up in LA, I actually grew up in the hood, and I have a question for you guys. What does the hood mean to you? Raise your hand if you like to share. Neil, do you know what the hood means? Okay, so um, it was very common for me to uh, see um, prostitution, drug dealing, violence, um, drive-bys, we would drop to the floor if we hear gunshots. In fact, my big brother got shot right across the street from his high school. Um, and that was very normal for me. And then I've learned that, wait a minute, that wasn't normal when I came to Wisconsin. I, I finally removed myself from that environment. But LA is home to me because that has always been a place where, where I feel that I fit in, right? Like everyone is just so diverse, different cultures, different race. I've never experienced racism until I moved to Wisconsin. And that, unfortunately, that's the reality in certain outskirts of LA. But my point is, so then I ended up moving to Green Bay, and then I moved to Madison in 2016, and I joined Rotary, I think, coming up in two years. 
and Rotary, it has been a place I have never felt a sense of belonging. And I'm so grateful for that because Rotary is really able to provide that type of space. So I thank each and every one of you for allowing me the opportunity just to connect with you. And I have connected with many of you, and I look forward to continuing to connect with even more of you. So I definitely find that sense of belonging, and I'm grateful for that. I tend to connect. Um, I have been given the opportunity to serve, again, because it goes back, back to that place and sense of belonging. Um, you know, I serve on committees, and I really value, and I'm grateful for how we come together, and we're able to disrespectfully disagree, and I love that, and I'm so grateful for that. And then I've been given the opportunity to serve on the board of directors. Thank you, fellow Rotarians, because you decided that. <clears throat> And I think um, joining the board of directors will allow me the opportunity, which I'm very grateful to continue to grow as a person and professionally. And then even when I'm not at Rotary, guess what? I get to see some of you at yoga. So thank you all so much. And I am so, so grateful for each and every one of you. Thank you, gracias Aureli. Aureli, maybe you should start a Rotary Yoga Fellowship. How about that? It could be a stretch. So, oh, I don't know. Janet, <laughs> our program committee chair, Janet Perino, is going to come up and uh, give us an update about the Rotary Program Survey. That was really bad. <laughs> Hello, everyone. First, I just have to um, give my appreciation to the music committee who did an amazing job today. So thank you for that. Um, when we were singing E-I-E-I-O, Susan Schmitz uh, leaned over to me and said, I feel like I'm in second grade. And I said, second grade? Those are the best three years of my life. <laughs> Okay, now, enough of that. So I am Janet Pereno, um, and I have the privilege of uh, serving as chair of our Rotary Program Committee. This is a nine-member committee that works very hard to come up with speakers from a variety of sources to help keep all of you engaged and coming to our Wednesday meetings. It's a labor of love for all of us. And to make sure you know this is not just a one-woman show, could my fellow committee members please stand so we can express our appreciation for all the good work you do. <clears throat> I have a terrific team to work with, so I'm very happy about that. I'd also like to thank Pat Jenkins and Jane Custer for all they do to keep us in line and take care of logistics and provide TLC for our speakers. Thank you for all you do. <clears throat> so I'm here today to share the highlights of our annual Rotary Program Survey that we distributed late last year. First of all, thanks to all of you who filled out the survey and took that time. We received 126 responses uh, from our members. It's about 31% of our club. And we generally, um, uh, our response rate is between 30 and 35%. So this uh, tracks with years past. 71 per, uh, I'm sorry, 71 of our members shared positive comments about the quality of our speakers generally, compared with six comments from members who thought we could do better. And as positive as those numbers are, I am bound and determined to turn around those six people. <laughs> so let's see if we can, that's my goal. Um, we're also happy to receive many comments. There were about 10 pages of single space comments. And I'm serious about that. I was really grateful for that because it really gave you the chance to express um, some specific thoughts. And for the program committee, that is what for us is the most helpful. So I spent some quality time with those, uh, with those comments and three messages stood out. 
Um, multiple members told us they wanted more topics on the environment and climate change, more business-related topics, and fewer topics on DEI, or what some people called the woke agenda. Um, in regard to the latter, uh, diversity is very important to our club, and there are no plans to roll back uh, our commitment to being inclusive. However, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> However, our club leadership in the program committee do take your comments very seriously, and we will work hard to include more programs that celebrate our local businesses uh, and dive into the environmental challenges of our time to ensure that our programs are balanced. We're already talking about upcoming business-related programs on the success of Wisconsin's biotech industry, the importance of nurturing our startup entrepreneurs, and Wisconsin's uh, workforce challenges. And when it comes to the environment, we are working on upcoming programs on creative ways groups are engaging the public on climate change, success stories on combating the loss of endangered species, and a unique program that helps corporations adopt sustainability programs. There were also multiple responses from members who wanted more programs on science, technology, and innovation politics and elected officials, affordable housing, and programs that showcase our members as speakers. And people apparently just cannot get enough of Melanie Ramey and Charles Tubbs because we got several comments on how much they love them, some Charles and Melanie. Um, you also told us you like to combine speakers with demonstrations or interactive presentations uh, and that you want a call to action from many of our speakers. So we have passed that along. Last but certainly not least, you gave us many excellent speaker suggestions that the committee is currently considering. Uh, so thank you for your attention and for filling out the survey. You'll find a few printed copies of the full survey results on the table in the back. Uh, and there will be a link in the results, uh, uh, link to the results in the Friday email. So again, the committee appreciates your feedback and wants members to know we heard you and we take your comments very seriously. So stay tuned. Thank you very much. I want to give a special thanks to Janet and the program committee. I think they've been having, we've been having fantastic programs. Um, so it will continue. Your feedback is really important. So please keep it coming. Please keep your suggestions coming. And we take all of that into consideration. All right. Um, Q&A. Remember we have, after the program speaker, we have question and answer. It seems like we need a refresher course on the Q&A rotary four-way test for Q&A. And the author of that, Mark Clear, is going to come up and talk about it. Mark? Thank you. Thank you, President Charles. I am not here to yell at you, I promise. I'm only here to yell at a few of you. <laughs> So you have all seen the slide with the four-way test for questions. Jane's going to put it up there to remind us. I'd like you to just take a moment to reread it while I provide a little context about why we have these reminders and a gentle nudge about how the four-way test for questions improves the meeting experience for everyone. The four-way test for questions, just like the rotary four-way test, is about respect, showing respect for our speakers and for each other. Our speakers graciously share their time and expertise with us, and good questions helped prompt the speaker to provide more information from their expertise. Good questions also demonstrate to our speaker that we are that they have stimulated our curiosity and that we are engaged with their presentation. Sharing your comments, thoughts, your own experience is a great way to engage with the speaker after the meeting. <laughs> Most of our speakers offer to stay for a little bit after the meeting and engage one-on-one -on -one with Rotarians and keeping questions, real questions, coming is a great way to, to um, separate those two things. But please save your opinions and your stories for afterward. Another way we respect each other is by ensuring that all Rotarians have an opportunity to ask questions within the very limited time that we have together. That's a nice way of saying, as your second grade teacher said, let's not always see the same hands. 
I should also note that President Charles is not yet considering fines for frequent transgressors of these guidelines, but that remains within his authority. <laughs> Question time is, is an important and valuable part of our meeting experience. Let's keep it that way by ensuring we all respect our speakers and each other by being mindful of the four-way test for questions. Thank you. So think of your think of your questions, right? Our program committee does such a great job of lining up our speakers and they have such a limited amount of time and so we want to hear their comments. We want to hear your questions. So thank you. Okay, a fun drive update. Charles Tubbs was going to uh, give us an update. Um, unfortunately, his brother passed away yesterday, so we keep him uh, in our thoughts and hold him in our thoughts. But our wonder wondrous President-elect, wondrous, one wonderful. Jason Ilstrup is going to come up and give us an update on the fun drive. Well, I did notice that Charles Tubbs was on that list of your favorite speakers, and I was not. So, you have that opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just needed an ego boost. I also, there's been a lot of talk about Old McDonald in second grade. Let me just be clear, I have a one-year-old and I sang it last night. Uh, and so I think it's for younger, but I actually want to say a big thanks to the music committee because you actually told me what the sounds are for animals. My wife thinks that I literally just do a roar for everything. Tiger, lion, Elephant, parakeet, peacock. The only other one I have down well is an owl. Hootie hoo! That's it. Anyway, you didn't you didn't like me before. Now you're not going to like me after this presentation. <laughs> At any rate, fun drive. I took the D off of fun because it's a fun drive. Eighty-one percent of you have participated in this year's fun drive. Let's give a huge round of applause. Mm, but our goal, our fun goal, is 100%. But don't worry, you 19%. Is that the math? Is that right? 19? Yeah. 19%? You have one more week. One more week. All we ask is any donation that you can give. $5, $500, $500,000. I can't do that, but maybe some can in this room. We would love any gift of any size. Our goal is not a numerical this year. It's really focused on 100% participation. We are getting so close. So we'll see the other 19% money coming in between now and next week. Thank you all for those who have given, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Jason. We're getting closer, right? But we will do the big reveal on the total next week. Hopefully, Charles Tubbs will be back then to do that. But um, let's get 100% or as close to it as possible. Thanks to everyone who's given. We have birthdays to celebrate with a bit of humor and wisdom that complement Rotary's mission. And we also invite our celebrants to make a gift to the Synergy Scholarship Fund. This week's birthdays are Tanya Zastro, who shares a quote from Lady Bird Johnson's speech at Yale University White House Diary, October 9th, 1967. The environment is where we all meet, where we all have a mutual interest. It is the one thing all of us share. It is not only a mirror of ourselves, but a focusing lens on what we can become. January 22nd, Al Bryan. January 23rd, Tyra Grays. January 24th, Mary Helen Becker, January 24th, Tom Walker, January 25th, past president Angela Bartell shares this from Rudyard Kipling. If history were taught in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. That is why I look forward to the 2024 groundbreaking for the Wisconsin Historical Society's new Wisconsin History Center on the square where the society will connect people to the past as never before by preserving and sharing stories of all of our history. January 25th, uh, new member Nicole Lopez Percopile. January 26th, Cheryl Cato. January 26th, Joe McNeil, who serves as our Madison Rotary Foundation treasurer. January 26th, Chris Rich. The 26th, Trey Sprinkman. January 27th, Jim Hamray. January 27th, Rick Kiley. January 27th, past president Susan Schmitz. Let's thank all of our celebrants for their contributions, and let's wish them a happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Rotarians, happy birthday to you.
Elaine, I thought there was going to be an E-I-E-I-O at the end. Oh, oh okay, I, I missed that. <laughs> That's my fault. <laughs> All right, members in the news, Sandy Morales was quoted in an article in Madison 365 about their campaign, It Takes Little to Be Big. Christian Overland quoted in the State Journal about the city's oldest bar embracing history. And Tanya Zastro was pictured and quoted in the State Journal about the midwinter restoration of the Royal Thai Pavilion at Ulbricht Gardens. On to today's program. Our speaker today is Ruth Schmidt, who's led the Wisconsin Early Childhood Association since 2002. She is a champion for advancing policy that recognizes child care as a public good worthy of long-term public financing. Ruth has vast connections to economic and workforce development, local governments, philanthropy, community partners, and policymakers, in addition to Wisconsin's early childhood community. The title of her speech is The Case for Solving Child Care, Public Investment Has Returns for Children, the Workforce, and Thriving Communities. Ruth, we look forward to your presentation and to thank you for being here today. We've made a gift in your honor to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund. And we will have Q and A questions and answers uh, afterwards. And today we're also going to be doing our extended talk back session. Ruth has agreed to stay for an extended talk back question and answer session um, in the poolside terrace. She may even accept some comments then, right, Ruth? But, but uh, let's welcome Ruth to the podium. Good afternoon. Um, I have to say, I was sort of a bundle of nerves getting ready for today. Like, I've, honestly, I've been doing these presentations for the entire 22 years I've been at WECA. Um, and yet, every time I come into one of these settings, I am just ever so slightly nervous. Um, and so being welcomed so warmly today uh, by so many of you um, has just been really important to me. Um, and I have felt welcomed um, and really appreciate the fact that you almost got more participation in singing of The Farmer in the Dell. No, is that the one? Yes. Okay. Old McDonald. Uh, we, then we get uh, at our early childhood conference where we have like four to 600 early childhood educators in a room and you out sang them. So thank you. Um, that was wonderful. So, um, as was noted, Ruth Schmidt, Executive Director of Wisconsin Early Childhood Association, where I've been for many, many years, probably too many years, and at the same time still coming back to say, we need more done in child care. Child care continues to be in crisis in our state and in our country. And I am here today to convince the six of you who held out on the speaker bureau selection process um, that I'm probably one of the best speakers you'll hear uh, because this is such a critically important topic. So thank you. It's an honor to be here to present to uh, folks in business, community leaders um, in and around the Dane County and Madison area. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity. I also want to give a shout out and express gratitude to Laura Gallagher and Steve Goldberg for their sponsorship sponsorship of today's meeting um, on behalf of Red Caboose. Red Caboose, we love you. Thanks for all you do for our community and for children. So, yeah, you can clap. It's good. Red Caboose is great. Thank you. Okay, so just a little bit about WECA, very, very briefly. We've been around since the 70s. Um, so while I've been there for 22 years, I haven't been there the whole time, um, while it does feel like a lifetime for me. Um, and our sole purpose in existing is to lift up the work of the people who are caring for some of the most important people in the state of Wisconsin, our youngest children, our babies, our toddlers, our preschoolers. Um, and my organization exists to lift up their work, to support their work, to provide surround supports to them as they do that work, because we have yet in our country to figure out how to fix what's going on in childcare so that we can retain highly qualified, caring individuals to care for our young children. 
So that's what my association do. We have a team of about 100 people that work across the state. Uh, we provide services probably to about 80% of child care programs. So if you think about that, there's about 4,500 child care programs in the state, probably 22 to 24,000 people working in this field. We touch the lives of a lot of those educators who are caring for children in communities across our state. So today, I want to tell you a story, a little bit about a story. I finally learned after years of presenting that I should tell stories. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a story. Um, and this story is going to be anecdotal, but based on real experiences, stories that we're, we hear regularly from parents, from providers, and yes, from business leaders, workforce development, economic development, chambers, all the people, um, those of you in this room. Um, this is a story that will resonate with you. Uh, because it is framed in Wisconsin's economy and Wisconsin's workforce, um, and it frames child care as a public good. So, chapter one, we're going to learn the setting for the story. I'm not sure if anybody recognizes this setting, but this is just a random healthcare facility. Um, and this, this random healthcare facility serves uh, the Dane County area and well, well, well beyond it, um, employs close to 24,000 people, not all living in this community. Um, and we're going to imagine today and provide some great accuracy to the real life day in the life of a human resource person in a large healthcare system where challenges with childcare prompt a series of challenges from work staffing and from a productivity standpoint. So, healthcare workforce is disproportionately impacted by childcare. In large part because 76% of people who work in healthcare are women. If you look just at registered nurses, that number goes up to 85%. And this means that when women who are parents of young children are at work supporting our health and our well being and the well being of our community, and they grapple with childcare problems, the cost of childcare, closures of childcare, classroom closures of childcare. Uh, when they grapple with these issues, it has a ripple effect on all of us and on the well being of our community. In child or in healthcare, we know that childcare stresses, those individuals who deal with childcare stresses in healthcare, experience a 91% greater likelihood of reducing their clinical hours. That's something that I, I know I am constantly on wait lists to get in with doctor's appointments. This is something we can't have in our communities. And an 80% chance, greater chance of burnout than the peers that work in their system with them. When I did a really quick look at Indeed.com, I saw that right now UW Health has about 1,300 job vacancies. Um, and if you stop for a minute to consider whether or not HR professionals in our healthcare facilities are wondering about what the state of childcare is in our community, I can tell you right now, they are very concerned about this. This is a critical issue for healthcare as it is for all businesses, all industries in our economy. So as we close this chapter of the book about the stressed out HR department that is trying to fill jobs, uh, trying to reduce the cost of turnover, trying to retain a workforce and ensure that healthcare is provided seamlessly to our community, let's meet the protagonist as we head into chapter two. So this is Sue. Sue is a registered nurse. She's married, she has two children. She has, sorry, three children. Two are under the age of two and one is three and a half. Okay, so three kids under the age of four, not school age, needing care and childcare. She's a busy healthcare worker. She's trying to work split shifts. She's trying to be available on call. And she is trying to ensure that when those of us who need healthcare are in the healthcare receiving end of this as consumers, that we are getting treated with compassion and kindness and expertise in the healthcare field. So childcare for her young children is essential for her to maintain her employment and allow her spouse to also maintain a job so that they can be a dual income family. Let's look at the numbers. So let's assume that Sue and her spouse are a median income family in Dane County. And median income family in Dane County right now is approximately $9,100 for household, $9,100 a month. 
So after you take out basic expenses, housing, uh, utilities, food, um, their own health care costs, entertainment costs, and child care costs, which for three kids in the Dane County market would run you about $4,400 a month, you can see they end every month scrambling for how are they going to make up $775 that isn't income that they've got in their household. And these are real numbers. These are based on, act. this is not hypothetical, these are based on real case Dane County economic drivers that we see in terms of all of these costs. So for Sue and for many of her, Child care is taking up a significant portion of their income, right? For the average person, the average family in Wisconsin, they are easily finding themselves spending 25 to 30, 35% of their household income on child care. Um, and Dane County is actually what I would consider sort of a shining spot, right? We have incredible care. We've got high quality care. We have access to care. We also have care that is out of reach in terms of what it costs for a lot of families. But if you looked at counties slightly to the west of us, like Crawford County, and you look at Sue and her spouse and the three children and working in healthcare, they'd end the month $2,900 in the hole because of the disparities between incomes in our communities, right? So child care does continue to be this crisis issue for us. Um, so what's Sue to do? So let's look at the next chapter of our story, which is where we meet the heroine. Maybe, there, Christy. So I will always, like, I will always consider our childcare providers the heroines, right? <laughs> like, um, for so very many reasons in my own life, um, and raising my own children, and the work I do with my peers and colleagues, and the amazing work that people in this field do every day in our state to care for and educate our children so their parents can go to work, I will always consider childcare providers the heroines of all the stories that we're experiencing. So Christy is the teacher in the child care program where Sue takes her children. Um, Christy has an associate's degree, and yet, if you look at the numbers, and this is again true for the overall state of Wisconsin, the average hourly wage for someone with an associate's degree in early care and education in our state is about $12 an hour. It's slightly more than that in the Dane County area, but it hovers around $12 an hour. And that's with a degree. Um, they don't have access to benefits often, uh, so these are benefits that most of us take for granted. In child care, less than 20% of individuals who work for um, a group child care program have access to and participate in an employer-sponsored health care plan. That's 20%. So this is a basic benefit that most of us expect and get through our employment. That does not happen in child care. So she's doing some of the most important work in our society. She's ensuring that Sue can show up at that random health care facility um, and provide good services and good care for all of us and our families. Um, so how is it possible that in this industry that's doing such very critical, important work, we're seeing this wage disparity? So this is a quote from Christy. Um, Christy says, I can go to Quick Trip, Culver's, Taco John's, any of those places. Uh, and make more as a starting wage. As I was driving in here, I noticed Culver's was hiring at $20 an hour for adults. You know, that is $8 an hour more than the average childcare person is making. Um, and you can do this without an education, without continuing education requirements, and without incurring student loan debt, right? So we have this system. This is not to knock the quick trips and the Starbucks and the Culver's and all the rest of them. We all appreciate being able to stop on street corners to pick up small groceries, get our cup of coffee, fill up our car with gas and move on, right? These are services that are absolutely critical to our life and we're willing to pay for them, right? That's not necessarily the case with childcare. This might be kind of hard for some of you to read because um, it's small, but this is looking at the business case of like what a childcare business looks like. Um, Secretary Janet Yellen, Secretary of the Treasury, has said, has called childcare a failed market. If you look at this and if you can dig into the numbers of this, this is looking at just a small childcare program, average program in Wisconsin. 
This program is serving about 50 kids, 52 kids. They have about 10 staff. Um, and that's to have a director, teachers, assistant teachers. And their parents are paying about $10,000 a year to send their children to this program. So if you look at the little pie chart, you'll see what happens with the revenue that comes into this program, right? And this is all parent fees. This is what's unique about childcare. It is funded almost exclusively by parent fees. So you look at what happens with those numbers, right? You've got a big percent going out in rent, in utilities, in insurance, and I'm gonna say in liability insurance, if you can get it, because it is increasingly challenging for this field to get liability insurance for their businesses. If you look at all of these expenses, by the end of the average year, this child care program has about $230,000 left. And if you do the math, you'll figure out you've got 10 employees, you've got $230,000. Like, I'd be running for the hills, right? Like, no, I'm not going to work at this child care program because there's no revenue left. It is this model of how we pay and how we put revenue into the system that allows parents to work, right? Like, I would argue the only reason we have a system of childcare in our country and in our state is because we have parents who need to work outside the home, right? Or inside the home. We've also experienced that during COVID. Child care is infrastructure. It's like our roads, it's like our bridges. It allows people to get to work, um, but we don't pay for it that way. We expect parents to pay for it all on their own. So when we hear sometimes rhetoric around, why should we bail out child care? My response to that would simply be like, you bail out child care because child care is the industry that bails out just about every other industry, right? Like every parent who has a child typically under the age of four has that child in some type of care setting outside the home in order to go to work. This is an economic driver of our state. So I wanna just talk a little bit at a high level about some of the challenges in Wisconsin, um, as though I haven't already, some of the challenges in Wisconsin around childcare. As I said, um, childcare is expensive. It's often not available. Half of our state is considered a childcare desert where there's more than three children for every one slot of care in the community that's regulated. In rural Wisconsin, that number jumps to 70%. The workforce, as I said, 80% of this workforce has some education out of high school, and they're making $12 an hour. This is a workforce that works in an industry that's critical to us. It's an amazing, resilient workforce of women, and yes, it is primarily, it's like 97% women in our state. Um, and it's a workforce that we need to get behind because you need a system of care so your employees can show up and work. You as community leaders, as local elected officials, need a good system of care because it's the backbone of our economy, it's the backbone of community life. So we did a series of webinars leading into the budget session last, last year. Uh, one of those webinars, it was geared at looking at the economic impact of childcare. And Missy Hughes, CEO of WEDC, came and presented at this. Um, and this was a quote by Missy Hughes. So with all of the factors in place that we just talked about, um, you can see there's widespread economic impact of all of this, right? Um, and when you hear that the top economic development person in the state of Wisconsin is addressing child care as a critical need, probably it's time for us all to pay attention, right? And this isn't to say you don't. I mean, you have me here today, right? Like many of you are very deep in these conversations. I know I've had many, many meetings with Jason Ilstrup talking about child care and DMI and, and what should we be doing as a city? What can we do? This is a critical issue. When you look at labor force participation, in the state of Wisconsin, labor force participation has, for women in the workforce has dropped to the lowest rate it has been since the 1980s. For the first time since the 1980s, it's gone below 60%. And you can't tell me that part of this reason is because women struggle to find affordable, health, affordable child care for their children so that they can work. And they're faced with making these hard decisions. Does it make sense for me to stay home? Or does it make sense for me to be paying 15, 16, 17, 18,000 dollars 
a year for childcare for my children, right? And it sets women up long term with economic losses when you take them out of the workforce for a period of time. So it's bad for women, it's bad for our economy, right? So sometimes um, when I am walking around uh, this lovely building in the city of Madison on the square, I'm not going to name what the building is, but sometimes I hear rhetoric around, uh, you know, moms should just stay home. We could solve this problem if moms could stay home. I suspect if I asked for a showing of hands in this room for people who think that that's true, um, I I'd be surprised if there was one or two that would raise their hands and then probably be embarrassed for having thought it was okay to raise your hand. Um, okay, this is, this is again something that the rhetoric versus the reality of what's happening is important for us to wrap our heads around. So Dane County has an unemployment rate close to 2%. Our state isn't much further along than that. Um, our economy, the livability of our community, all relies on having a strong childcare system. And yet we see this, need, this impact that is happening in the workforce, right? Parents of young children, 25% of them report being reprimanded at work because of childcare failures. 25% of them end up leaving their jobs because of childcare challenges, right? We can't afford, with 2% unemployment, we can't afford for people to be leaving their jobs for those reasons. So, in 2021, uh, WEDC and Department of Children and Families did a survey of businesses in Wisconsin. Um, and so I've been talking to you about the childcare industry, what the challenges are, what we're facing, right? Um, this was done of businesses to find out what do businesses know about childcare and what's happening. And what we find is this overwhelming sense that business understands there's a child care challenge, right? They know it's going to contribute to long-term workforce issues for our state if we can't fix it. Um, they know that it is something that is going to impact a family's ability to move into a community and take a job in that community if there isn't affordable care available. So many of you, I believe, are business owners or leaders in businesses, leaders in the community. If you were faced with all of this information, um, and if you were faced with knowing that you hear and believe that child care is an ongoing issue for our communities, for your businesses, for your employees, what might happen, right? What, what might we, as thoughtful people, do with that kind of information? Um, unfortunately, we aren't yet seeing this kind of total buy-in where businesses actually are going deeply into their employee base to learn more about what might the solutions be, right? To talk to employees about what does this look like for you, what are ways we should be supporting you. Um, they don't know a lot of what is happening in their own businesses. They know what's happening broadly across the economy. They don't necessarily know what does this look like in my place of employment, right? And I apologize, this one's going to be really hard to read too. I put it in at the last minute because I think it's compelling. This is from the WEDC DCF survey. And what we see here, the growing red lines, that's the area that em employers are saying, nope, we're not doing that, right? So this is what are employers planning to do or currently doing to sort of address some of these childcare challenges. Um, and while we see lots of businesses getting behind policies, right? Policies around allowing working from home, um, policies around flexible scheduling, those kinds of things. We see a lot of businesses doing that. And yet in our state, Less than 30% of businesses offer dependent care flexible spending accounts for their employees. Like, to me, these are these no-brainer things that businesses can easily do, along with continuing to be part of the conversation. If you dig deeper into that, you'll see less and less and less businesses doing things like supporting child care on site, uh, partnering with a local child care program like a red caboose to purchase slots for your employees, those kinds of things that I would argue I think our businesses are going to need to be part of coming up with the solutions of what we should be doing. The outcome of all of this is an economic loss of $1.9 billion to our state 
just because we have a breakdown in infant and toddler care. So this is only for people who have babies, basically, right? Just the fact that they can't find and afford care for their children results in a $1.9 billion economic loss to our economy. And that's in lost wages, tax revenue, productivity of businesses. Um, so again, I think what I'm trying to do is simply say there's a compelling case for why we need to be addressing this as something more than you had the child, I raised my children, and I did, right? Like, my kids are way gone. Um, and, and I paid for their childcare, right? When I started at WECA, I took home $2 an hour after I paid for childcare, right? Um, so we all do it, but at some point we have to say there's a greater good in understanding that childcare is part of the public good of what we need to do for our state. It is infrastructure, it is roads, it is bridges, it is ways that parents can get to work and work. So after the, the last year was a budget year in our state, we all know this, we all probably followed a lot of what happened at the Capitol this last year. Um, child care. Anybody who opens the newspaper in the morning, doom scrolls on their phone when you're supposed to be doing other things at work, um, anybody who turns on the radio, listens to any of the local talk shows has heard over and over and over again the importance of investing in childcare, that we have a broken childcare system. 60% of childcare programs are trying to hire right now. And if they can't hire, guess what they do? They close classrooms, right? They close classrooms. If they close classrooms, it's not one family impacted. It's eight families. It's 15 families. It's 20 families impacted. And if you look at the number of employers that impacts, it's both moms and dads. It's spouses. It's caregivers who can't go to work because of it, right? This is so critical to us. So it doesn't matter how you come into the childcare conversation, right? There's all sorts of different mechanisms by which people enter this conversation. People enter this conversation from the business perspective, right? I need to be able to hire people, and I can't right now, so I'm interested. Talk to me. Let's talk about what we can be doing, right? Um, people enter this conversation because you're community leaders. We saw, literally, I would say, at least 72 child care task forces start across our state, one in every county and probably one in every tribe, over the past three years during the pandemic to figure out what can we do with child care. And I'm going to argue that when I talk about a call to action as we come towards the end of this presentation, um, I'm going to argue that we don't have to do a lot. We just have to talk, and we have to use our leverage, and we have to use our influence, um, and that, that is ultimately what changes what is going to happen and what is needed in this field, right? If we only end up with a system where businesses are helping to purchase care for employees that they employ, we end up with a system of haves and have-nots, right? We end up with children receiving disparate care depending on where they are, and who can pay for that care, whether it's a business or their parents. This has to be a conversation that we look at as something that is a public good for us, where we need a state investment of public revenue to be able to help underwrite the cost of care so that child care programs do not need to continue to raise rates for working parents. So however you come to this conversation, and there's so many angles that you come to this conversation, um, come to the conversation, right? I, mean, I guess that's what I really want to say. Like this past year, we did legislative forums with legislators and business leaders across the state. We had about 225 business leaders come uh, and have conversations with their legislators about why child care is important to them. We did a series of webinars, uh, again, looking at economy and workforce issues in child care. We had 400 business leaders participate in our webinars, right? There are people who are hungry for a solution. There are counties that are grappling with what do we do about this? Can we slice and dice it? I've got money in my community. Too bad about you. We can fix it here, right? Um, I'm saying right a lot, aren't I? Um, anyway, what I, the, the most important point to me in this is this conversation went from zero to 60 
when COVID hit. Um, people started paying attention deeply to this issue. Our argument is keep paying attention so that at some point we can join other states that have done the right thing, purple, red, blue states doing the right thing, putting state money into childcare. And instead of opening these conversations with gloom and doom, uh, what's everything we're facing, we can flip the dialogue on that. We can open by saying children are getting the care they need, parents are able to go to work, our economy is supported. So please continue to be part of this conversation with us. Um, invite me back. Um, and you won't have to sing uh, Old MacDonald again. I'll do it myself if you invite me back. Um, anyway, please stay part of this conversation with us. Use your leverage. Talk to your employees. Talk to businesses that you're in relationship with, your local elected officials, and let them know that it's time for Wisconsin to do something on this. It's time for us to make a state investment. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very important topic, and we will have, if you have comments, questions, and answers, there'll be answers afterwards in the poolside terrace. Ruth is uh, kindly staying. So thank you very much for your presentation, Ruth. Um, next week, I hope you'll come back and join us. Our speaker is going to be Lisa Johnson, speakers Lisa Johnson and Daniel Bianc about pioneering partnerships, Wisconsin's evolution as a biotech hub. So come back next week. And um, before we leave, please stand and we will recite together our rotary four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? We are adjourned. Have a good week, everyone. Yeah.